Okay, so I've started my um, recording there. So just a few things to discuss with you. I'm going to be going for about 60, 60 minutes here. We have got a jam jam packed um, call here or webinar here. So I'm, if I'm going too quickly, if you don't understand anything, then please do write in the um, chat and I will get back to you. Or if you're watching this recording, then please do email me because, like I said, this is jam packed. We're getting um, sort of 17 years of my experience here, jump back into an hour, so it's, it's going to be a challenge, to, to say the least. Um, if, you, if you look just below your name, you'll see you've got some icons. Um, if you click on the face one, you can look smiley faces and applause and lots and lots of different things. You can press them at any time, um, and I can see them. So if you like what I'm doing or don't like or want me to go slower or faster, you can use them. You've also, as you can see, got um, a raised hand, so if you've got a question that you want to ask me, you can just press that, and that will um, raise my hand if I've missed it in the chat room or something. And then as you, if you click the tick, you've got um, a yes, no there. So if I ask you, do you understand, or um, you know, you've got any questions, you can just click the yes or no rather than typing, because it's a little bit quicker. Hello, Tracy, nice to see you. Um, so, you know, that's that's what you use those icons for, so hopefully they will um, all be, we'll all be able to use them and we will be able to move forward at, at such speed here. Let's just all have some sort of smiley face, I think, even though it's, it's not very smiley weather in the UK, I don't know how it is anywhere else, but I'm going to have a smiley face because I like being happy. Okay, what I'm going to do as we get going here is I am going to take myself off video because I, what I find is that it can be really distracting so you can be watching me rather than um, the slides. So, like I say, jam-packed. We're just going to um, get going here and not waste any time because we've got lots to go through. And any questions, then, uh, you know, please do put them in, in the chat room or raise your hands or email me, Sarah, sarahnewton.com if you are listening on the recording. So... Let me just take myself off video here. Great. Okay. So, Generation 2.0. How do we connect and engage with a generation that we don't understand? And, oh, yes. That's why I get asked a lot. So, let me just tell you a little bit about my background. So, that's going to sort of um, allow you to know what um, qualifies me, I guess, to stand here deli delivering this webinar or sit here even delivering this webinar. I've been working with young people for over 17 years now. Um, just to give you some perspective on that, that was when um, Max Zuckerberg was nine, <laughs> the first Office DVD was released, and um, the first text, they just figured out how to send the first text message. That's how long I've been working with young people. Sounds ridiculous now, doesn't it? Um, I was worked with um, children at risk and young offenders in the police um, for 10 years, and then I left and started um, my own business, which I've been doing for another um, 10 years, so it's probably more than 17, it's probably getting nearly 20 now as I actually say that. Um, I have been very, very lo lucky and blessed in my career and um, very early on I um, was on TV a lot, I had my own series that um, all around the world actually, it's been to New Zealand, Norway, Australia, Poland, um, America and obviously in the UK. I also got my first book called Help My Teenagers and Alien, um, published by Penguin in 2007. I've recently released a new book called um, Teen Years Don't Get and I'll Get Through It. So, you know, I don't really like to, to list awards and accomplishments. I think it's not the sort of person I am, but I feel like I need to tell you that just so you know um, my experience and where I've come from. Now, about four or five years ago, um, I started to notice a real, real difference in our young people. They're just started to act different, to be different, and I noticed that I needed to really upgrade my skills and my knowledge if I wanted to continue to work with them. So I really, really delved into the field of generational theory and of technology and how they use technology, and that's the information that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Because, you know, I was seeing the things in the newspapers like children are dumber, they've got no real friends, they're less social, and I was looking at the young people in front of me and what they were saying about them just didn't seem to gel with what I was seeing in front of me. And as I delved more and more into this generation, I realized that everything that was the same about the past was just changing and, and that these young people were changing 
not only how they were parented, but also what was going on in the schools, how businesses were, were merged into them, and how organisations were working. So they were having some massive, there's some massive, massive changes going on. So I realised that I really needed to to delve into that and see and see what was happening. And for me, it felt like really what was happening is that there was children sort of adrift in this world that seemed to adults seemed to know nothing about, had no control over, and um, didn't really know what to what to do with. So I felt that it was my job to find a, um, bring those two worlds together and show parents but not only parents, also organisations and schools and businesses, what they needed to know about this generation so they could really connect and engage with them at a different level. And it felt like we were at a pivotal point, and I think we still are. You know, it's almost like we're at this crossroads within people, and we can either you know, turn one way and destroy everything that's great about the internet, everything that's great about what they're doing, or I think we can make sort of um, a really great choice and, and move towards a brighter future. So I have got a very different way of looking at technology and a different way of looking at, at young people, which I'm going to um, share with you here. You may agree, you may disagree, that's fine. I'm not sat here saying this is the answer, I'm saying it's an answer and it's the answer I believe in. But let me know what I'm kind of doing with you here is fast forwarding us to the future. Some of you that are listening, your homes will already, or your businesses, or whatever, will already resemble what I'm talking about. For others, we might be a long way off, and that's neither good nor bad. Um, what I'm going to do here is really, really give you a glimpse into the future of where we are going. And this isn't just my belief, it's, um, it does stem from, from research too. So, let's have a look at the objectives. What do we hope to achieve in this one hour here? There we go. So we're going to look at who are Generation 2.0, what are the differences between the generations, how are generations um, interacting with each other, how Generation 2.0 are different, and how do you, as a parent, or as anyone that's listening, um, get through to them, and how do we motivate them? Now, if I talk about parents a lot in this, um, just know that you could really take out the word parent and put in, in the word organisation, business, school, or um, coach, or consultant, or, or youth worker, you know, it can apply to everybody. This isn't just, um, just relates to parents, just that that's the more about the topic of this talk. Excuse me, I just need to have a, a drink here. As, and hello, Vida, it's nice to see you again. As Vida will know, I've just come off another 90-minute call, so I apologise if my voice doesn't hold out. I hope it does. I've got so much to share with you. Okay, so, you might think, why should we care? Why do we really need to know anything about this generation? Aren't all kids the same? This is why I think you should care about it. When you understand the next, and that does say next generation, you understand the future. And that's by an amazing man called Don Totscott, who wrote Growing Up Digital, and he refers to this generation as the next generation, because they have been changed so massively um, by the internet. Growing up with technology has changed them. There's no doubt about it. It's changed the way they think, interact, and socialise, and what they expect, certainly from the adults around them, and that is what we are going to go into um, tonight. So, here to me is the question that we are asking about our um, young people. Are they spoiled teenagers with short attention spans and zero social skills? Are they bright children with revolutionary ways of thinking, interacting, and socialising? And I think that that's the question that is constantly being um, sort of juggled around when it comes to this generation. And depending on what media you listen to, or depending on what you think about about this, um, I think they are a little bit of both. But but mostly, I think that they are bringing to us as um, a society revolutionary ways of thinking interacting um, and socialising and that's what I really want to go through with you today. So before I move on to the next slide, I just want to um, ask you all, do you, when I say Generation 2.0, what does that mean to you? What do you think I'm talking about? Um, it may be obvious, but I just want to um, know. So if each of you could just type a response for me, that would be great, just so I can see where you are with that before you move on. 
see one of you furiously type in, a few of you furiously type in. That's great. Is it 20th century? Okay, I'll explain where all the words come from in a minute. It's a good... Maybe. I'm taking a drink here. Um, kids who have no other way of um, thinking than going to the internet as a first result. <laughs> that could possibly be the case. Okay, let me tell you, this is one of the most researched generations that we have ever, ever had. And I can tell you why that is, because when the, the eldest of this generation started to hit the workforce, the workforce did not know what to do with them. They were so different than any generation that had gone before them that the workforce and businesses and big corporations went into meltdown, literally. So they, they started to research this generation massively so that corporations could understand them. And here is just some of the names that this generation has been called. The Google generation, 21st um, century generation, the screen agers, the technology generation, the echo boomers, the next great generation, well, the iPad generation, the gaming, I mean, we could go on for any. any. Um, the millennials is maybe the one that is used now the most. And the millennials, sorry, it refers to children that, came, that sort of came to age, meaning they came into their um, teen years in the um, new millennium. So in, 2000 onwards. Generation 2.0 is often used to refer to them. And actually, Lisa, when you were saying it's to do with the web, it was a little bit. What they found is that when, and I don't want to go into the web in great detail and the formulation of the web, but when the web first came out and we had websites, they, it was called Web 1.0. When the web started to go social and we started to get things like um, Twitter, Sorry, not Twitter, it's to get things like Facebook and Twitter. It started to be called Web 2.0, which meant um, it was much more social. And actually, it is now moving into something that's called Web 3.0, which is where there's much more um, participation. So Generation 2.0 was named that way because this generation is believed to have changed massively when the web moved from being something static to something interactive. So um, that's why I chose Generation 2.0 because really they have been so um, changed by the internet changing. So yes, it was an awful lot to do with the internet, but um, yeah. But any of these we words would you will use when we go into generational theory, you will see exactly what generation I am talking about. When I refer to Generation 2.0. I am talking about a generation that the eldest is possibly um, in their, you know, late 20s, 30s, isn't it? Their youngest, well, we, you know, is, is children being born nowadays, although it tends to be sort of between the 10 and 30 range that we're referring to, because I think the generation coming up behind them will be very different again. So that's what I'm referring to when I talk about Generation 2.0. So let's just look at some facts about them. They can spend up to 10 hours a day in front of a screen. This is some research done in the UK by um, NPower. Obviously, it was done over the holidays, but I still think, you know, they probably could spend 10 hours a day in front of a screen. By the time they're adults, they will have consumed over 10,000 online hours each. Now, this is really significant for a few reasons. If you read the outliers, 10,000 hours is the amount of hours that um, Malcolm Gladwell says you have to do something to become an expert in it. Um, and we will figure out later what we are experts in. Also, if you look at school hours, and in the UK, if you add up all the hours that they go to school from, say, reception till year, um, till the final year of secondary school, it adds up to one, um, I think it adds up to something like 11,800 hours. So they have this whole other type of education going on outside of their normal education. They are the most numerous, most affluent, and better educated and, and more ethnically diverse generation than anything that's become be before them. They are often called the, the dumber generation, but actually IQ points have raised three points per decade 
since the 1930s. So they are not getting dumber. It's something actually called the Flynn effect, if you wanted to look that up. They're the most wanted generation ever. This is the, only, the, the first generation that most parents really, really want. You know, in fact, some of them want them so much. They're having, you know, we've got fertility treatments going on. We've got great contraceptives now. Most children that are being born now are wanted. Um, a recent Gallup survey came up with this, these results. They have less free time, a 38% decrease in unstructured time than any generation that have gone before them. But the good news is their parents are more involved in their lives than ever before, with 66% of young people saying that their parents are in touch with their lives, 80% saying that they have really important talks with their parents, and 94% saying they always trust their parents to be there. So there's some really good news coming out of this generation. Um, their teachers are more demanding and they have more homework. So that's the kind of the generation we're looking at. That's what, what the stats and the statistics are telling us um, about this generation. The, the, now, the statistics I've shared here, um, Sheila, are actually for the UK. Um, I will, but my sense is that in the US it's probably, you know, you could probably chain, change these a lot. Um, and actually you're much more ahead of, ahead of us. And I'm going to write myself a note to have a look at US statistics for you. Um, but it might take me a while to find them. They don't tend to be the easiest thing to find. Thanks for that. That's reminding me. But obviously, you know, I'm dealing with UK children mostly, so and that's what I'm. Yeah, you, um, the, the the stats of parental involvement might not be. This was actually the the, um, the children saying this, not not their parents. Interestingly enough, but. Um, there might be something similar, so we'll see if we can find that. Okay, so let's have a look at them as a generation, because I think this really helps us understand them. Um, and people say to me, why do we need to understand generational theory? And this is why I think. Because shifts in society happen through generational pressure. When we can understand where our young people sit in a cycle of generational theory, then we can start to understand them a little bit more. Remember, this is what all of this is about. How do you understand them so you can connect with them? Now, the theory that I use is something called by Howe and Strauss. That's H-O-W-E and Strauss, S-T-R-A-U-S, I think. Um, a lot of social scientists think it's a bit simplified and um, don't like it, but I really like it. And it, and it really applies to what I see in front of me and actually it's really easy and simple to to understand. Generational theory, the, what, the one I'm talking about, basically takes a hundred year cycle and every 25 years we have a different generation emerging and that generation has almost like a different job um, in society. Um, so let's just go through this. Okay, so, so there's, there's Basically, each gen generations have turning points. They reckon these turning points happen about every 25 years, and then a new generation is born from that. And there's four turning points. You've got an awakening, an unraveling, a crisis, which I guess that's where we are now, and a high. So let's um, just look at these um, in turn. So an awakening. This is um, where this is where our reactive generation is called. The generation that, the exists, that th these exist at the moment were, uh, were people born from 1964 to 1984, so I'm in this generation, quite often known as Generation X. This is the most destructive generation in the cycle. <laughs> they, are the, they destroy everything, so they you know, and so actually destroy them and sort of pull them down as in institutions, social norms. Everything is challenged in this generation. This is where we get our really, really badly behaved youth. They're actually, as children, they're very underparented as well. So you know, I, I certainly remember growing up in, in the 80s, and my parents being not very involved in my life at all in comparison to how involved I am in my children. So we have this awakening where this generation comes, comes along and sort of destroys everything that's gone before and says that, you know, that institution is not right, we see lots of riots, we see lots of unrest in this period. And then after that we have an unravelling. 
this is where a generation is born that tries to make sense of the new order. So the generation before broke everything down, and this generation comes um, up behind them and um, tries to make sense of what's going on. This is where Generation Y, um, or the, some of the millennials will sit. These are children born 1985 to 2001. They are actually called the heroic generation. Their job is to build up new institutions, so they're very cooperative. They tend to um, fight for the, the, the good, collective good, and we can see that happening. Um, you know, if we look at um, things that are happening in the Middle East, you know, they, though they may look destructive, actually what they're talking about is building new institutions. We can see this happening all over the place at the moment. So after this unravelling, so we then have a crisis, um, which is about 2001. So any children born after 2001 fit into what is at the moment nameless. Is this generation is being called Generation Z. They may get another another name. I have heard them called many many things. Um, but their job is to build up structure. They are going to be the most conformist generation we've seen. Very very risk averse generation. Um, so they build up the structure. I'll, I'll answer that one in a minute, Tracy. And then we have a high. Um, the next high, we've well, currently is due in about 2023. Yes, we've got to wait that long. And then we have born a new generation. Now, the last generation that were in this um, cohort and they're still alive, obviously, was the baby boomers that were born from 1946 to 1964. And their job is to make everything ideal and reach for utopia. Um, and they're all about instilling morals and values. And let me just move on to the next slide and you can see how this operates all together. So we have an awakening. Generation X come along and they destroy everything that's gone before. Then we have an unravelling. This Generation Y, the heroes who help sort of unravel all the mess and start to make sense of the new order. Then after that comes a crisis, and this is where Generation Z come into their force and they start to build up new institutions and start to rebuild everything. Then we have this high, which is where the last baby boomers were, and this generation is all about instilling the morals and the values and make, you know, making us go through this you know, real high, we're all doing the right thing. And then, of course, Generation X comes along um, and destroys it again. And so you see, this is like this 100-year cycle that keeps going and going and going. And if you look back in history, particularly if you're reading um, information by Howard Strauss, this um, repeats and repeats and repeats, and, and that's where this information comes from. Who gives them the name? Well, they are. This information normally comes from the social sciences, and um, so it, it really is about a few key, key people giving them a name, and then it's sticking. Although nearly every single person that has an influence on generational theory will have a different name for them. This is why if we go back to that slide, that was just the names for, for, that would come up for the last two generations, so Generation Y and Generation Z. So, you know, it, it just depends who names them and who gets the most, in, you know, the book out that, that most people read to what they eventually became known as. That's why the millennials are called the millennials because of a book that was produced by Howard Strauss, which I think was called Millennials Rising, and that became a very influential book, so they were called Millennials More. So that there really is no hard and fast rule, Tracy, about who names them, unfortunately. In fact, you know, I've, like I said, I've already seen about four or five different names for Generation Z. So when we look at our young people, just so you know, we are dealing with Generation Y and Generation Z. So we are dealing with these two generations here. Interestingly, these two generations are the most traditional generations in the whole of generational theory. So actually, you know, we're not going to see some really difficult, difficult children again for a very long time, <laughs> apparently, yet we're still treating them like they're really, really difficult. Um, and here's some more research. Now, this research is actually worldwide research that I'm coming now. So it was, it was all over all countries. Um, just so you know, Sheila, it was um, done all over Europe, all over the UK, and all over everywhere. Um, MTV did some research. And 
here's what they came up with when they researched our young people. They asked them for their Ten Commandments and their seven deadly sins, and I think this is really, really interesting. So, their commandments should get a good job, not rack up huge debts, not eat junk food, respect the planet, get good qualifications, settle down with, with a man or woman of our dreams, um, travel and experience other cultures, always offer a seat to an elderly person, work hard to buy a big house, not litter the streets. That's what they said their Ten Commandments were. The seven deadly sins, antisocial behaviour, addiction, bullying, racism, obesity, debt and laziness. And I think what, for me, so just makes me so happy reading these is that obviously the messages that we're giving them are getting through to them. Um, so this is what your children or the children you are working with, this is what their utopia looks like it was called. And actually, that MTV research, they came up with a, with a name that I think is really, really funny and really does apply to this generation. They called them the New Young Fogies because 91% of them said they wanted to find someone and settle down. 90% are interested in current events. 82% feel that a su successful career is very important. And only 18% didn't care what they did as long as it made up some money. 62% want to work hard for a nice big house, and 39% want to learn because it broadens their horizons. And what's so funny is when we start to delve into this information, I think, is how at odds it is with the information that we're hearing in, in the media. So let me just take a, a temperature check here. And what's the one thing so far that um, sticks out for you hearing, hearing all of that um, last piece of information, just so I can make sure we're all listening? So the one thing that's sticking out most. I see you all starting to write there. They still want material possessions. Yes, they do, but what we're finding actually, um, and this is um, research that's just coming out that I was involved in, is that the older they get, it, you know, they are getting less and less um, wanting of material things. So they're more likely to rent things than buy them. And, you know, a lot of this, you know, the economy has had a huge impact on those older children in this generation. And even though they look, you know, in their youth, like they're very, ma very materialistic, actually the older they get, the less materialistic they're they're, they are getting. And actually, most of the evidence coming out says that, you know, yes, they do want the newest of this and the newest of that, but it's actually much more important to them that they tend to be happy. So there is some other research coming, coming out on that, which I just don't have in front of me at the moment, I'm afraid. Well, yes, um, utopia is, you know, when we look at generational theory and generalising like this, we are generalising looking at that big cohort that sits in the middle of children that aren't, you know, extremely wealthy and have everything and children that aren't, you know, in trouble at the bottom. We're always dealing with that big generalist, you know, of 80% of people that sit in the middle because, you know, there will always be children that are misbehaving, there will always be children that that needs stuff. So yes, when we are talking about this, we are talking about that, you know, cohort of, I, I don't want to say normal, but I will, you know, normal in inverted commas, um, children. They are, yes, they are. Um, I see Tracy A, you put that they're more, they are interesting, they are to appearance and stage stardom, and we'll go into that in a little minute and explain that. She really find it interesting. Fascinating. I find this stuff fascinating as well. Yes, they are very, very different in generations um, than, than before them. And I think what's happening, particularly in our young people now, is that most of them have been, gen uh, have been parented by Generation um, X, who are 
obviously the naughty children and I mean I certainly look at my child and think she's not doing half of the things that I was doing so we as parents we think that our children are going to be doing all the things we were doing we over parent them and actually they're not doing any of it at all now you might ask you know I was saying before about the fact that this was one of the most researched generations um, and one of the reasons was is that they found that something was re being created that had never been created before and it was something called a generation lap and um, it was the first time in history really that a generation had known more about something so important than the adults around them and this was obviously the internet so teenagers enthusiasm has motivated other family members to use the internet and their skills helped them to overcome it the power dynamics between adults and youngsters was being slipped they became the technical support gurus and the adults needed their support. This has never been seen in any kind of um, generations previously. And if we look at generations gone back, the biggest um, jump of sort of knowledge that we had last was in the Industrial Revolution. So the, the, the internet has brought around as many changes as the Industrial Revolution has done. But what this generation has done is different is that they've outlapped the adults and something that was so so important which is the internet and technology that's changing the world um, and actually the adults are catching up now a bit some adults not all of them businesses are trying desperately to catch up with them but this is what changed everything um, really and I love this quote that I just want to share with you this is a unique period in history in which the role of the child is changing and it absolutely is, make no mistake about it. I don't think our children will ever be seen again as they, they have been because of the, what the internet and what access to technology has, has given them, you know, good or bad, and we will go into some of the negatives in, in that later on in the slides here. So, how do we kind of get through to them? How do we connect with them? Well, first of all, I think we need to look at like the norms of this generation. And for this, I'm going to go into something called the eight gen norms. This was a worldwide four million pound research project done on thousands, I think over 11,000 um, children worldwide uh, to try and find out what the norms were of this generation. So we could start to... Um, relate with them and communicate with them a bit more. I'm just going to share them with you here and talk about them briefly. Okay, so here they are, the eight gen norms. Just as you, as you look at that, and you look at those eight there, which one sticks most out for you as being um, the most important? It would just be great to get a temperature check here before we move on as to what you think, and then I'll go through and explain them. Which one jumps out at you as being the most important innovation? Okay. Lisa, Sheila, Riddler, any thoughts? Integrity. Integrity twice. Could oh no, it didn't come up twice. It's me going mad. And customization. Okay. Speed. Right. I'm going to go through them all um, individually and just give you my take on them. I think they are all as important as it, as it, as it, as it oh, sorry, I think they're all as important as each other, but I think that there is a few that have made them um, really, really um, different. I think, firstly, I'm going to come to customization because to me, I think that this is the one that's had the biggest impact um, on, the, on a, well, one of the biggest impacts on a lot of things. This is that this generation can customize absolutely everything generally um, from there you know if we go back look at those MySpace skins if you can remember that far back and how they could change the way that their um, MySpace looks they can change you know everything on the internet their, you know, their backgrounds on their Twitter pages and they tend to like things that they can customize more um, I was recently working with um, some young people and they were messing around with this pen I didn't really know what they were doing and I went to have a look and they mixed together a thick biro pen and a highlighter to make up this new pen. You know, like they will customise their phones, they will customise the settings on everything. They, ev nearly everything they can get their hands on, they can customise to make it work for them individually. And that is, you know, 
having a huge impact on how they're being marketed to and also having a huge impact in how businesses are having to deal with them. And schools that have got their heads screwed on right are having to look at how do you customise a learning experience a little bit more. But that's probably for an entirely other, um, other um, webinar there. Freedom, they are a generation that has an awful lot of freedom, but it's a freedom different than the freedom that we think. We, we had freedom outside. They have freedom in these internal worlds, you know, inside, and in the internet. So they have this massive amount of freedom um, internally, but actually probably out, allowed out as much as we were as children. And scrutiny. They are, or have been called the Y generation. They scrutinise absolutely everything. And it's not surprising, you know, there's companies logging, there's people putting out information there, and they are not afraid to say, this is right and this is wrong, and to ask questions. They are very, yet they um, scrutinise each other massively. They will, they, I think the internet has just sort of taught them to not take anything at face value. They know how things can be changed. They know how you can change a picture to make yourself look great in it. They know how you can alter you know, body images on models. So they are scrutinizing of everything. They have got an sense of integrity, but it's a little strange and it's a little mixed up to what we would think in, um, in, of integrity. So, you know, they might talk about healthy, being healthy, and then be doing vodka jello shots. But they, you know, they tend to expect integrity in others, and they tend to, you know, expect you to deliver on, on what you say you're going to. Entertainment. They love to be entertained. They are an, um, a generation that loves entertainment, but their entertainment is very different than our entertainment. We were passive consumers. We sort of sat there, and um, the telly just came to us. They are now active participants in everything. You know, and there's even I've seen some series having children go online and come up with the next plot line. They are actively involved in whatever they're doing. Even if they're watching something online, you can gu guarantee that they are um, talking to their friends about it. And if we're talking about what TV, let's look at the customization of that. They will now watch what they want, when they want, how they want. Um, innovation, they are a very, very innovative ge um, generation. But I think this innovation comes from their creativity and how the internet has allowed them to get really, really creative and that that is really changing everything. Um, collaboration, um, I think this is a biggie too and something that as parents we really, really need to take on board. They are such a collaborative generation. They think we, not me, despite what we think. Yes, they, you know, and every teenager can be self-centered, but actually they are always thinking for the sort of the common good versus the, the my good, if you can just get them out their out their heads and their, their way of way of thinking at that moment. And yes, speed, they want everything quick and they want everything now and you know, everything, the food is quick, the internet is quicker, um, they they'll you know, they go up online or go on BBC iPlayer because they want to watch this now rather than, you know, they don't want you know, everything is just quick, 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 quick. And we and we do need to um, I'm not saying that we need to change because of them, but we need to accommodate them and have a, um, a very different approach with them. So let me um, just give you some ideas here into how you can use these in your everyday life. So how do we get through to engage and motivate them? Well, appeal, appeal to their better nature, because they do actually have one. And if you're you know, in a family, and if, you're, if your child is saying, I want to do this, and you're saying, I want to do this, a really good question to ask is, what's good for the family? Because they have got this collaborative nature, they're very quick at coming to collaborative decisions, and there's been research done on that too. So appeal to their better nature. Ask them, what's for the good of the family? What's for the good of the class? What's for the good of the school? These are questions that certainly I wouldn't have been able to answer as a young person, but they can. Their heads are sort of screwed on that way to be able to answer those questions, to appeal to their better nature. Give them freedom to choose. You know, say to them, this is this is the you know, this is what I want, this is the result, how are you going to deliver it? That's a really, really good way of of getting them to to make a good choice. Is to give them the freedom to choose. It's over to you now. What do you choose to do? 
give them constant feedback. Um, they're a, a generation, like we said, speed is important to them. They need feedback, good or bad, instantly. There's no point in a sort of um, putting everything together for one big meeting with them, um, particularly if they're, you know, they're an employee. We need to tell them straight away when they're doing something good or when they're doing something bad. Give them instant feedback. Customize your approach and make them feel special. Now, this really makes us feel makes it difficult as um, parents. But what I found about this generation is that if you, they think they're going some standardized method from the box, they will book against it. So take each situation on face value. Make them feel that they are being treated like an individual rather than part of, you know, this is what the parenting book says that I've got to do with you because they will just, you know, you've lost them. They really want to feel special. They've been called the trophy generation because, you know, you get trophies for just turning up, um, they do want to feel special, so make them feel special. Tell the truth to them always. Don't hide things, don't hide feelings. If there's something wrong, tell them. Um, they really want to know, they expect to know. Collaborate with them. If you, and I think as parents we don't do this very well at all. I think that we can, um, expect that we have to have all the answers and sometimes we don't and what I find with this generation if you go to them saying this is what I'm trying to do how are we going to work together this to happen you know you, the schools told me that you're capable of getting A's or A stars how are we going to make this happen how are we going to work together make them part of that solution they will mu be much much more um, invested in it definitely I think quick, bright and shiny as a great marketer I know called um, Carol Phillips and that's what she says, if you want to market to this generation, think bright, quick and shiny and that's a little bit how we need to think whatever we're doing with them, is that we've got to make things fun, we've got to make them interesting or why would they want to take part in them anyway. Allow them to create and innovate, um, you know, have family meetings if you've got them in your home, get their get their feedback on how you can make this family a, a, a better place, How, what would they do, what, what can you do that's different, because they are really creative and they are really, really massively innova innovative, so, you know, use them, and like I said, research has shown, and I can't remember where this research is from at the minute, but um, that they are 10% quicker at problem solving um, than us adults, so, you know, use them, really, really use them. Let me come to that question. Do, do I think you can overpraise? Yes, I do. And I think that um, we have a generation now that have been overpraised for absolutely everything that they do, so they expect it, and it actually makes an entitled generation, which isn't, I believe, a very good thing. I think that we should say, you know, well done when something, you know, is well. And I also think that we should, when we praise, we should be saying, you know, I really respect your co the commitment it took to achieve that rather than I'm really proud that you've got an A. So I think that even the way we praise is going to be um, very different. Yeah, um, it, I it, is, it is something, you know, I'm not a great fan of the sticker charts or anything like that at school either. I think that, um, that people should be doing things for them, but that is a much, much longer conversation, Tracy. And, um, Let's leave that one and maybe come to that at the end if there's a little bit of time um, because we've still got quite a lot to get through here. I know I'm going really, really fast because there's so much information um, in this. So just quickly before I move move on, um, let's have one word to what is coming up for you at the, at the moment or a, a sentence to what, you're, what you've learned so far before we move on here. Just going to take a drink. Well, there's lots of stuff in this webinar. you or furiously type in there. Yeah, we don't have all the answers as adults. And you know what, Lisa, when I learned that, I was a happy, happy parent. And this is probably the thing that's helped, helped me in my parenting so much. I have two questions that I use a lot, and they are how and why, and they are transformed how I work with people. How and how Sorry, sorry, how and what? How are we going to do this? What are you going to do to make this happen? We, 
we need to work with them because they are great problem solvers. They're just amazing and they're great collaborators and we don't use that enough. We think they're exactly like this. Great description. I'm glad to hear that we're on, on, on power. Sounds good. I feel I would want to dig a little deeper into some areas in case I get some questions from the audience. Um, yes. Um, we will dig, in, dig into these more, Tracy, and I know that you were referring to the Talking Teenagers um, webinar. We will delve in a little bit more in that one for you. So, let's move on here. So, what does this mean for the family? Well, I've recently been involved in some... I've recently been involved in some research that went on with a, a channel um, in the UK, which was... Um, talking about where are families going and, and so therefore what adverts do we need to be showing them on telly. So I know if Marcus is picking it up that there is something changing and this was where we'd be going. We're moving towards something called the new open family. Some of you will be here at the moment, some of you will be going there but it's something um, and if your practitioner is working with young people and parents it's something we need to know about. Open families are transparent, open and honest, and are built on mutual understanding and acceptance when dealing with issues. They learn, adjust and evolve, not just assuming there's one formulaic answer. And that's um, what is deemed as a new open family. So let's just have a look how they operate slightly differently to what we, you know, what, what we're sort of led to believe. So here is, here is what's in and out. So, for example, We've got things like the naughty step, punishment, separate spaces, separate viewing, telling our kids, don't tell the kids, and isolation. All of these things are moving out of the new open family, and what's coming in is family meal times, the confusing point of families. Families having conversations about everything and discussing everything. And you know this starts to happen when you see adverts, and particularly in the UK now, and I can only talk to the adverts in the UK because I don't know what's in the countries. There's adverts in cars that have been, um, what you see is that it's the children talking about, making the decision about the car that they want. And that's, you know, you just have to look at what's happening in marketing if you want to see where everything's going, because the marketers have to be on top of everything, because if they're not, they lose custom. So, you know, I know that we hate adverts, but actually looking at them gives us a real insight into where families and young people are going. And there's this real feeling of togetherness within these families. Now, certainly, the, the image of a child in their room, on the computer alone, playing a, a game, is is going to be a thing of the past soon. Yes, it's still happening, and yes, children will always take themselves to the bedroom. But what we are finding now is that there's been one big communal space where all the family members are, and each family member will be probably doing something different, but they will be together. So there's this real um, kind of togetherness happening. This is why we're seeing homes being built with the bedrooms smaller now, and the um, communal areas bigger because long gone, you know, the, the houses of the 70s and 80s had huge bedrooms where teenagers would hang out and leave themselves there forever. And that's going now, we're seeing smaller bedrooms because they're becoming less important because they want to be with their parents because they like us. <laughs> Yay! We're having this whole, let's discuss it with the kids. Big decisions are being discussed with the kids. Where do they go on holiday? What's our next car we should buy for family? This stuff is really, really being discussed and we're playing together. Look at the old kind of video game where someone played alone. So we've got, you know, Wii's and um, uh, Xbox Connect and whatever they are. And all these things c coming out that are having, allowing people to be social while they're gaming. Things are changing. And there's this convergence. Whereas, and what do I mean by that? I mean that people aren't in isolation anymore. Everyone's doing sort of everything um, together. So there's this sort of huge um, change happening within these open families. And, and even the word family is kind of changing slightly as well, is, is we're getting um, things called f um, fram family, which are, which are their friends around them. And actually that, that young people are, are creating their own sort of families with, with friends. So the whole concept of what a family is or was or, you know, 
is changing and therefore the way that we need to operate within those families is is changing too. And if par you know parents sometimes say, well, where do I start? We're just starting with just having family meals and discussing things um, with your with your children is is the, the best way to start really. So you're probably there listening thinking, okay, this is all great for Sarah. Yeah, we've, you've convinced us technology is good, but is there some bad sides to them? Is there some things that we need to be aware of? Yes, there is. Let me just go through them with you here now. Here is what I see, uh, what I'm going to call the invisible threats of the internet. We all know, we've all heard about the threats, you know, about sort of online stalkers and bullying and for me they're threats that have always been around and they're just a different medium now and I could talk about them for a whole sort of session in itself so I don't want to talk about the really visible things I want to talk about the invisible things and I love this quote by Henry Jenkins it says kids don't need us watching over their shoulders they need us to watch their backs and that's what I think is, is truly truly vital so resilient. What a lot of employers are finding is that this generation are, are not very resilient. Their online worlds allow them to die and get back up again. They allow them to say something on Facebook and put lol at the end of it and it be okay. Because although the internet can teach a lot of things, it can't teach concepts like honesty and integrity really. So our children are becoming less and less resilient. So what this means for us as parents, that we need to set them challenges offline that are allowing them to be resilient, to not always step in, um, to not always solve their problems for them, because they are not learning this stuff online. They need real life experiences to, to be learning this overload. Um, some research recently said that they can put 8.5 hours of work into six. They are overloaded. What you are seeing now is our young people are, are trimming their networks, actually. Um, so their networks are becoming smaller, much more um, specialised than, than bigger and, you know, with, with anybody in. But they are overloaded. And I think for parents it's important that we all take a technology day off of the week if we can, that we go on technology-free holidays, that we allow them and give them the ability to be able to switch off. Um, and, and for that to be okay, I mean, I certainly know that when I'm out um, with my phone, if, my, if one of my daughter's friends can't get a hold of her, she'll send me tweets asking me where she is, you know, and um, dear me, I mean, can you imagine having to put up with that as a child? We never had to, so I think we need to be able to give them permission to switch off the quality of what they're producing, and I think this, Lisa, goes into something we said earlier, um, is that they just search things up on the internet. But some of our professors in this country particularly are getting very, very concerned with the quality of work from young people, because what they are doing is they are being asked to research something, they're going on Google, they're looking at the first few pages of Google, and they'll get the answer, and that will be their research. Um, so as parents, people that work with young people, we need to make them dig deeper, we need to question what they're doing. So, you know, they don't just take what Google says is gospel. Um, responsibility. There is no responsibility online, is there? We can say something and we can take it back. And this is why I think that we need to give our children more, res more um, be able to be more responsible in their day-to-day -day lives, give them more responsible, make them res responsible for something in the home and um, don't give them any excuses for not being. We need to teach them this. Um, the internet doesn't teach this at all. The digital imprint, for those of you that don't know what this is, this is whatever we put online stays online, it doesn't go somewhere. Um, the head of Google, Eric Smith, recently said that um, young people would have to change their names by the time they're 21 because there would be so much information about them online. Um, while I don't think that's true, I think every, every child um, has a trail behind them and if they want to know what that is they can go to one two three people I think it's dot com and you put in your name and it shows you all the information that's out there about you on the web and it's quite shocking it, and I think we just need to start having conversations with our teenagers about this um, identity 
you can be whoever you want online. One day you can be a boy, one day you can be a girl, you can be 21, you can be 51, you can be 11. Um, and while I don't think that this is any real challenge, you know, we all did it as children, it's just that when we did it, you had to go out and buy a whole different set of makeup, a whole different set of clothes, and it was expensive. Now you can do it really cheaply. I think as parents, what we just have to do is to, you know, be aware that this is happening and help our, our young people get really clear what their identity is. And the pressure. They all know they're one YouTube away from being famous because they see it happening all the time. And I think we just need to know that they're under enormous pressure, especially young girls. And we need to be telling them, you know, you, it's all right to have to want to untag you. You don't always have to go on webcam. I just think we need to be aware of these things. And it's like I said at the beginning, you know, we are at a crossroads. We can embrace what, what's great about the internet and work with our young people to form a different future, or we can sort of rag on it and keep saying it's really bad and distance ourselves from, from it. I know which one I would prefer. Now, I did say to you earlier that our young people are becoming experts, but what are they becoming experts in? And I want to just briefly go through something with you that shocks me every time I um, look at this. It's some work by a wonderful woman called Jane McGonagall, who wrote a book called Reality is Broken. But it's certainly worth looking up and reading. She's got some TED Talks um, out as well that you might, you might want to look at. She did some wor wor um, work so into the world of Warcraft, and what she found is that we collectively have been playing World of Warcraft for 5.93 million years. That's about when we got up to start walking. That's how much experience we have of World of Warcraft. So she started to ask if that's how much experience we have, what are we learning? And what she found is that gamers particularly were, were learning to be blissfully productive, to be productive for hours online quite happily. They were learning to have this real sense of urgent optimism about solving some really, really big questions. They had an epic meaning, you know, every game has an epic, you know, mission that you're moving towards. And what she also found is that they were great at building social fabrics around them to reach their goals. So, for example, in World of Warcraft, you're always set a, a challenge that's a little bit above your level. And to get to that challenge, you have to build a great team around you. So what she then started to do was she started to create games, like the game that you can see on this slide called Evoke, which was, um, I think that one was about poverty. But she started to create games about, you know, the oil running out in the world and about poverty and, and asked gamers to come and start playing this game. And the gamers that got through this game the quickest with the best results. She then teamed up with social entrepreneurs and they're now working on how to change some of the world's real problems. And in fact, at the moment, she's working on a big um, health project. So what she started to do was harness that in information that gamers are using and music for good. So I just wanted to share that with you because I think that's quite amazing. But when it comes to um, young people and technology, this is what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for this <laughs> for the time where the actual... Um, computer can become the parent. I don't know what you think of that. I think it's quite funny. I, I like that. But I want to leave you with this quote here. How children behave online is not a predictor of what they will do when they become young adults. And I think that we forget that. What they do online is not a predictor of who they will become as young adults. I'm just going to leave, leave this slide here about me. Now, I have shared so much information with you there. We've gone through so much. And if you're, you know, a parent listening to this and you're thinking, where do I start? I said, just start by having family meals. Start by just taking one of these ideas. You know, if it's just right, and you know what? I'm going to collaborate a little bit more in my home. Um, I'm going to ask my children how they're going to do that. I'll ask them what they're going to do to, to get us um, to, you know, to the, the results that we want in this, in this home. So I shared lots and lots of information there with you. Um, phew, I'm going to stop talking now. For those of you that are on this class because you're part of the Talking Teenagers um, program, just know that we have another um, webinar where we will be going through this and picking this um, apart. This is just so you can see how it's delivered. So I hope that answers that question, Tracy. So what I want to know from you now is, um, firstly, do you have um, any questions for me? If you do have a question for me, please put it in the um, chat room now. If you don't, just press your 
no button from the tick. Then I'm going to ask you, um, what have you most learned? I'm going to write these down. Sorry. What have you most learned? And what are you going to do differently? So, what have you most learned? What are you going to do differently after this call? So, um, let's just get there. And I know I've shared so much with you here. This is a really, really packed webinar. And Tracy, um, I am, you know, once you've answered them questions, I can see you if you want. Um, Tracy, I will stay on and just answer that question you had for me about praise. If you just want to sort of put that as an actual question for me, that would be great. But if you could tell me what you've learnt most and what you're going to do differently, ooh, that should be do differently there. As you can see, not definitely. I've made up a new word there. After this call, that would be great. Thank you for bearing with me. That was um, a busy one, so to speak. So it's been great info. I'm encouraged because the state of the teenage mindset is not nearly as dismal as some Generation Xs would have to believe. Yes, you're absolutely right, Tracy. <laughs> Tracy Sheila, sorry. Um, each generation parents in a different way. We overparent as a generation because we were underparented. We do need to spend more time with a child discussing things. That's absolutely um, true. Yes, I think as Generation X, we remember our childhood, we remember how bad it was. So we step in to intervene, thinking our children are going to be as bad as we were, but actually um, they're, they're not at all. Phew, you're right, Lisa. That was a lot of information. I like to over deliver. <laughs> this is a lot of information. I plan to take the information and share with adult mentors so they can understand the, di um, the differences better. Okay, what you might want to do is just take some bits of it then. Just take some bits of it and, and use that. The bit that you say, think listening to this has the biggest impact on you. Um, if you were to just to take one bit, Lisa, what do you think that would, bit would be? You lost the slides, but you could hear me, but you couldn't respond. Yes. What was the question you had for me about praise, Tracy? So I'm just going to go through that here. And then the questions that I've got for you is, what have you most learned and what are you going to do differently? Yeah, even though they are different, they're not bad. Um, the, the piece that I... Um, like to use most, and I think has the biggest impact, is when you go through generational theory and use the utopia slides and show them that actually we think they're bad, but they're not, they're just different. And sometimes you don't know what to say when they catch you doing something wrong, which you tell them what to do. You just say, you know what? I apologise. I told you not to do that, and I'm doing it. That's wrong. I'm so sorry. Just be honest. You've got to be really, really honest um, in integrity with them all the time. Okay. Um, okay, I'll answer your question about praise now. Um, empty praise too often. It's not going to do a child any damage, particularly. But it just makes them think that absolutely everything that they're doing is, is great. Um, the way that I think it's better to do it is to look at the quality that what you're about to praise them for is. So, for example, if they've drawn a great picture and um, you want to praise them on the picture, you don't say, oh, that's a great picture, well done. You might say, you know what, that's I love how you've used your creativity there. So you don't just do this empty praise. You start saying, you know, wow, getting that result at school must have took a lot of commitment. You must have worked really hard. So you start to pick out the quality that is within them that's exhibited. 
that way you're not praising entity, which which really doesn't mean anything. Does that make sense, Tracy? It's a much better way of, of dealing with it, I think. Yeah, it's much better to use the, the, the word and the quality that you're talking about versus um, just going, oh, well done, that's a great picture. Oh, you kept within the lines. And I think, it, you know, it's, it's about us knowing that it doesn't happen all the time. And some children need more praise than others as well. You know, so if your child someone who really needs it, then, you know, that's fine. But sometimes we're just overpraising for the sake of it because we don't know what um, else to do. Well, actually, I think one of the downfalls of overpraising them is that they cannot handle any criticism, mistakes, failures. As long as you balance criticism with praise, you will have a well-balanced child. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, when, when it comes to criticism, it's not so much, you know, and I think that's just a word, but it's about saying, you know, maybe you didn't handle that the right way. What could you have done, have done differently? Um, because, yeah, I think too much praise without empty and I think that that's the big thing is if it's empty it means nothing to anybody so there's no point in, um, in, in doing it whatsoever so if you've got no more questions for me like I say I am going to stay here a little bit longer um, if, if um, you've got any questions for me I will be here if you haven't then you're quite welcome to um, leave <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed that, Lisa. And if you've got any questions at all, Lisa, then please do email me, Sarah at SarahNewton.com. Okay, Bidla, I'm waiting for the rest of this. In my child's case, I'm on, and I'm tentative, so I'm going to just switch the recording off now.